All right, everyone, welcome back. Welcome back. I'll give you a minute. If you're anything like most of us human beings, you are, you know, just running back to Zoom right when it's going to start again. <laughs> so I am pleased that we are moving to our second speaker today. And Marco, can you please spotlight as well? Is Ben available right now? Yes, Ben is here, but he Ben will stay without the video, so I cannot spotlight oh, Ben, unfortunately. Got it. Fantastic. All right. Um, so we are moving to our second speaker in the Alt AC from Academy to Industry series. As a reminder, you will be muted, but we do encourage your interaction, your questions, and so on in the chat area. And I'm going to turn it over to one of our fantastic Hewdown School of Human Communication doctoral students, Ben Brandley, who will be introducing Dr. Eric Waters. Thanks, Dr. Tracy. Yes, I uh, have the opportunity and privilege to introduce Dr. Waters. He earned his PhD in Communication Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. Today, Dr. Waters is a scholar and practitioner or academic who is dedicated to developing research with practical applications. While currently teaching an array of communication courses, mostly focusing within the organizational realm at Marquette University, Dr. Waters is also a consultant to small businesses, helping them with needs assessment, intensive team training, and coaching sessions. Dr. Waters' work on culture, race, cyberbullying, and entrepreneurship has appeared in various book chapters, handbooks, journals, and conferences. With such a fascinating range of experience, we welcome Dr. Eric Waters to our workshop. Welcome. Awesome. Dr. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. You have about a half thank hour. Thank you. Uh... <laughs> thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tracy. Thank you, Marco, for this wonderful opportunity. I'm very happy to be with you all. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Let's see here. Okay, so we should be up. Yes. Looks good. All right. All right, good. So let me just move this over. All right. So um, uh, as has been announced, uh, my name is Eric Waters. I'm currently on faculty in the Adidra College Communication at Marquette University. And um, just uh, recently, actually uh, late last year, uh, I joined the uh, team over at Sales Track Training as an independent executive coach slash consultant. Uh, as we know, the academic job market is in a bit of a precarious state. Unfortunately, there are not enough jobs to go around, but the good news is you can supplement or replace an academic career today by becoming a communication coach, consultant, or trainer. For me personally, uh, I began coaching in 2014 when I was doing my, my grad work at UT, and uh, it's been something that's been rewarding for me, uh, both uh, financially and uh, as well as uh, intellectually. So uh, let's, be, let's get into what we hope to accomplish in our time together. Um, hopefully, by the time that we're done, uh, everyone will be able to um, highlight the nuances and distinctions between coaching, consulting, and training, uh, provide some ideas for uh, building a client base. Uh, we'll talk about using theory to solve real-world problems for a client. We're going to actually talk about going beyond pedagogy when engaging clients. And, uh, you know, some of this will actually uh, repeat or emphasize or dovetail nicely 
with what we heard from Dr. Kaisinger. And I always like to talk about why this is important, the relevance of everything. Uh, obviously, there are some harsh economic realities facing academia. Uh, there's oversupply of academic labor, and this may get worse as the global job market changes. Uh, independent coaching and consulting are actually growth markets, so kind of on the opposite end of that spectrum. And this work, as I mentioned before, can be financially rewarding, and it can also be just as intellectually stimulating as what we do. So um, at this point, uh, let's start by talking about uh, coaching, consulting, and training, and looking at these as a bit of a directive continuum. But before we do that, I do have a couple of poll questions that I want to launch and kind of see where everybody is at. So I'm going to launch these now. Three questions about differentiating between coaching, consulting, and training. About uh, whether or not your university is a member of the local chamber of commerce. and whether our counterparts in industry are reading our journal. So we'll take a few moments and uh, see what people think. And this is anonymous polling. Your name it will not be attached to what you choose. <laughs> no career suicide here. Inching upwards close to 70%. Just a few more. Uh, I think we're good. So I think if I end this, I can get results. So uh, the first poll question, we can differentiate between coaching, consulting, and training in terms of how directive each intervention is. Which do you Walters, think? Would you like me to share the results so the rest of the group can see them or keep them just for you? Oh, let me try this. Can everybody see them? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, first question, we can differentiate between coaching, consulting, and training in terms of how directive each intervention is. Which do you think is most directive? Training is definitely most directive. And uh, I will tell you why in a minute. Uh, my university is a member of the local chamber of commerce. This is looks like it's a three-way split. Uh, we'll talk about this in a few minutes as well, because the Chamber of Commerce is actually very central to uh, becoming a trainer, coach, or consultant. And then number three, ooh, it hurts my heart. Do CEOs, VPs, directors, or managers regularly read academic journals? No, no, they do not. It is what it is. So um, this is good to know. This is good to know. So let's... Uh, Let's proceed and let's talk a bit about uh, the directives of coaching, consulting, and training. So this is the directive continuum, and we can judge how directive an intervention is based on who is doing the heavy lifting. The least directive interventions are client-driven. And the most directive interventions are driven by the, by the trainer, by the individual who is providing the service. So, indeed, training is the most directive. Uh, with uh, things like therapy, the therapist says, you know, I will help you heal. But it's still very client-driven. The client's doing most of the work and the heavy lifting there. Slightly more directive is mentoring, where a mentor will say, well, based on my experience, uh, 
I know A, B, or C. Uh, coaching is slightly more directive. Uh, I like to put it in the middle because it's the closest thing we have to a partnership and it is specialized. The coach asks the question such as, how can I support you? How can I help you? As we move to more directive, we have consulting. The consultant says, I'm an expert. Here are my recommendations. And this is what you're paying me for. And then the trainer. The trainer basically tells you how to do something. This is how you do A, B, or C. So we'll take a deeper dive into coaching, consulting, and training next. And we'll begin with coaching. As a coach, you are the expert who partners with the client. And the client needs assistance in improving something, perhaps some sort of uh, competency or skill gap. Uh, for example, I mentioned that I first began coaching during my grad school time at University of Texas. Uh, at the McCombs School of Business at UT, uh, there was a MBA plus program that actually hired PhD students from the communication department to do communication coaching for MBA candidates. Uh, things like um, networking and making small talk, things like writing cover letters and resumes. Uh, you know, these candidates are brilliant people. You know, they're going off to work for McKinsey and BCG and Bain, but they still need help with basic communication. Uh, another example of coaching, uh, currently I'm on a team that's working with a, a national nonprofit on leadership development. Dr. Waters, uh, can I just stop you just for a second? We're having a little bit of garbling on your audio side. It's not awful, but if, if there's anything you can do on your side to just, I don't know if it's a muffling with the audio or. Uh, let's see. Um, You're sounding better now. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, where was I? Um, I was talking about a project I'm working on with uh, my team at Sales Track. We're working with a national nonprofit to assist them in leadership development. Uh, we did a needs assessment, and based on that needs assessment, we determined that some one-on-one -on -one coaching was necessary in order to really move the needle for them to the culture. Next, let's talk a bit about consulting. Now, as consultants, you would do something that you're already pretty familiar with. Uh, you collect and analyze data in order to solve a problem, a problem. And you make recommendations to that client based on that analysis. An example of consulting uh, there was a, a project that I worked on for a, one of our donors a couple years ago where he was curious to know how small businesses who outsource certain HR functions were using the spare time and money that they save. And I did a project where I did some qualitative and quantitative work, and the findings revealed that uh, the companies, about about half of the companies that were outsourcing the HR functions, they were using their spare resources to try and build and develop and maintain their organizational culture. And, uh, you know, to this day, when I see this individual, he is very pleased and very happy with the results of that project. And then training. Uh, training is something that we are very used to because we do it in the classroom. The difference here is while it's similar to classroom teaching, the training I'm talking about is job related. Uh, soon after I took this job, I was asked to do some training with some small business owners regarding corporate communication. And uh, I did a session, part of which was training them on how to 
connect organizational mission and values to improving corporate reputation. And uh, it was very uh, interesting that many of them said, I didn't even know we could do this. I never even heard of this. So, so that, that was fun. And uh, that was actually very useful and relevant. So now that we've talked a bit about coaching and consulting and training, let's talk about availing yourself to potential clients or making yourself a bit more visible. So when you get some time, these are some of the first campus meetings you should take. These are some internal methods on availing yourself to clients and making yourself more visible. First, drop by the B school. Talk to some people over in the They actually may want you to train for the MBAs, or they may have where you can uh, train local business people. They may have some sort of uh, executive education program that you can contribute to. Uh, next, career services. Career services is a key interface between the university and the local business. Recruiters, they talk about career services often. In many situations, they are aware of uh, skills gap and challenges that are occurring within organizations. Might not hurt to make a couple friends over in the career services office. Uh, another place to reach out to is the Office of External Relations or Office of Corporate Relations. Uh, it, it may go by another name, but uh, many schools, they have a particular office in place to uh, partner with local businesses at the university level. And through this partnership, many schools offer professional development opportunities to local corporations. You may be able to throw your hat in the ring to take part in some of those activities. And then finally, you might make some friends over in the office of management. Uh, it's very possible that school alumni and other donors may look to the university for specialized consulting, especially if uh, they own a company or if they are VP or CEO. Uh, the project that I talked about earlier where uh, I was talking about sourcing HR, uh, this was a donor. And I got that contract because I answered a call from the people over in investment. Now, uh, Roberts, just another note, you continue to be a little bit garbled. We wonder if maybe your microphone is rubbing up against that beautiful bow tie you have or something like that, because it seems to be a little bit when you move. So just a heads up. Okay, yeah, um, my mic is on my earbuds, so I'm not sure why there's something wrong. But maybe I'm talking too loud. <laughs> we love your booming voice. <laughs> um, let's shift gears and look at some external avenues of making yourself visible and availing yourself to potential clients. Take some time to get off campus and network and ask people what they need. Uh, once again, the Chamber of Commerce most cities, they have a, a regular metro chamber of commerce, but then there may also be smaller chambers as well. Perhaps a chamber that caters to uh, the black community or the Hispanic community or the Asian community or the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, it's always a good idea to go on those websites and see if your university has a membership. If they do, you can often attend Chamber of Commerce events for free on the university time. And you can go and start meeting them, talk to them, asking them what their challenges are. 
if you talk to people and ask them where they itch, they'll tell you. Uh, another place you can to go off campus would be the accelerator. And accelerators are uh, basically organizations that uh, help startups and small businesses scale. Uh, some of the examples that I'm aware of here in Milwaukee, uh, Scalerator, uh, Scale Up Milwaukee, things like that. Uh, you can usually find them housed in co-working spaces. You may ask the people who run these accelerators if there's an opportunity for you to uh, do a couple classes or to do some coaching or have office hours with people who are involved in those accelerators. Uh, next, there are professional associations. And I know Dr. Kaisinger talked about SHRM earlier, the Society of uh, Human Resource Management. Uh, I will also throw out ATD, the Association for Talent Development. Uh, these are a couple places where uh, you can maybe get a membership, uh, maybe you can facilitate some programming and get in front of some people who need your services. Uh, I would also encourage you to become a part of the local startup community if that exists in your city. I know here we have Startup Milwaukee. I try to make contacts and talk to those folks as time allows. And uh, I was able to do that during my time in Austin as well. Um, finally, there's LinkedIn. I don't know why people have probably LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. Uh, it's much more useful than Facebook, in my opinion. Uh, you can share content on LinkedIn. You can actually write and publish articles on LinkedIn. It's much easier to get published in LinkedIn than it is in MCQ. I can tell you that for sure. And by doing this, you can position yourself as a thought leader. And opportunities will come and find you. Uh, let's shift gears. Uh, next section we'll talk about, let's revisit the practical implications. Now, this is a section that we uh, put in our papers, about a paragraph. And uh, I want to kind of reframe this and uh, make you look at it in a different way with respect to our discussion today. Uh, as we've established, uh, most of our counterparts in the industry, they're not reading our papers. So what we have to do is translate and apply theory. Understand that our clients are not college students. Our clients are not reviewers. Our clients are not a dissertation committee. And our clients are not reading our journals. But you are reading the journals. You are a master of the various theories. You can look at different models and skills, and you can decipher that stuff to look like a genius. People would think that you're the second coming of Einstein. If you can successfully take the work that we do directly and translate it into a practical solution for a client's problem. Uh, here's an example. And this should be pretty relevant as of right now. A company complains that they're experiencing company-wide Zoom fatigue. Everything is a Zoom call. No more emails, no more phone calls, just Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. And people are getting exhausted. Well, just hearing that, we can probably assume that they have a problem with data collection. Uh, and we can tie that back to uh, media richness theory. We have excessive views and surplus meaning. So as far as some interventions or um, ways to solve this client's problem, uh, we understand that employees probably need help matching message to media. As a consultant, we can collect further data to confirm this hypothesis. 
And based on what we find, perhaps by doing a communication audit or something like that, we can make recommendations for a job aid or for some additional training. And then if we are the ones who are administering that training, we can put together and facilitate instructor-led or virtual classes that help employees understand when to use certain media, help them understand the difference between um, rich and lean. And then um, since retention levels after training tend to be rather low, we may engage in or recommend one-to-one -one coaching to help some of that material stick. So this is a very simple case example of how we can take theory that our clients may or may not really care about and translate it and make ourselves look like true experts. Uh, the last thing we'll talk about today is moving from pedagogy to andragogy. As I said before, uh, clients are not students, and we need to engage them in a different way. And this is where andragogy comes in. Now, we have been schooled by our respective centers for teaching and learning in the art and science of pedagogy. And this is ideal for what we do in a university classroom, since we control most of the details of the class and we evaluate students using the grading system. Uh, in essence, we're playing that stage on the stage role. However, in a corporate training room, these are adults and they want more responsibility and control over their learning. They tend to be more proactive in seeking out learning, and they can self-evaluate their mastery of whatever they've been learning. So here, in a corporate context, uh, we play more of a guide on the side role. And uh, this concept of andragogy, we can trace it back to Matthew Knowles, um, I'm going to go over uh, six quick assumptions of andragogy that uh, I think are very relevant. Uh, first, adults need to know why they're learning something, which means what's in it for them? How does this knowledge benefit them today? Are they, is it going to result in a certification? Is it going to result in, in a promotion? Spell out exactly the whip them for the learning. Uh, next, experience provides the basis for learning. Adults actually bring years of experience to a discussion, which allows for collaborative learning through exchanging stories. So they're learning from each other and with each other. Next, uh, adults need to participate in the planning and evaluation of their instruction meaning that they want to choose what, when, and how they learn. So if we are facilitating the learning, we need to be flexible and allow them to partner in the learning process. Uh, next, adults are most interested in learning content that has immediate relevance to their lives. This means there needs to be an immediate need. Immediate need dictates readiness to learn. So if a client has a pitch coming up that they want to be prepared for, or if they're going to be writing or presenting a proposal, then that's immediate need. They'll be motivated to learn this, what we have to say based on this immediate need. Adult learning is problem-centered, not content-centered. We add tangible value by helping clients solve a problem. We're not just feeding them content they'll be tested on later. Uh, we want to help them accomplish something, help them beat the challenge. And then finally, 
uh, adults' motivation to learn is internal rather than external. With adults, learning satisfies higher order needs like self-esteem, self-actualization. Uh, we can take these from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, they're not necessarily motiv motivated by grade. Uh, in some cases, there may be some motivation that comes from maybe a raise or a promotion, but by and large, for the most part, the motivation is intrinsic. That's all I have, so I'm assuming that you all have some questions. So I will stop sharing. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Waters. You're getting lots of claps and reactions and people have been posting comments in the chat area. And I'm gonna kick us off and do feel free to um, continue to put your questions in the chat. I have tried to synthesize some of the things that it seems like folks have been coming up with. And as I did last time, it's not gonna be formatted all that pretty but I'm gonna put it in the chat of some of these questions. And I think I'm gonna start with this one, is you have a tenure track position where there's research responsibilities, uh, teaching responsibilities, and you have this other um, coaching position, you maintain this active um, professional work. So I am curious, what is it that you've had to or tro chosen to say no to in the academic world that makes both these things possible? Um, so are, you know, if, if folks wanted to do, and not an alternative to academic, but adjacent to academic work, how is it that they negotiate that on a day-to-day -day basis? So a couple things I think are helpful for this question. Uh, number one, uh, learn how to say no to service. And, you know, you don't have to be nasty about it. You can say, you know, this sounds like a great opportunity. This is just not the right time. Or, you know, I would love to serve on this committee, perhaps in a future semester or something along those lines. Because uh, uh, there will be no shortage of people asking you to do things that you may not want to do or you really don't have time to do. So learning how to say no to a lot of that service that goes up and above what your expectation is, that's important. Um, say no to teaching summer school. Uh, summers are where I really hard on writing. So, um, you know, I haven't taught summer school, I don't teach in summer school. I use that time for my writing. And if I can speak up uh, some contract work here and there, then that works as well. Got it, got it. Thank you for that. Another thing I wanted to follow up on from your presentation is you, you suggested that we should be reaching out to places like the business school, alumni services, or career services. If you were writing that first email, well, assuming it's an email, what would you recommend that folks say? You know, because I think we oftentimes say things like, oh, well, just, just go ahead and reach out. And we sit there and I, I, what does that mean? Do I walk over there and knock on their door? Do I, what does that look like? Um, I'm going to assume that resources and the college of business and uh, advancement and these other offices, they have websites where you can figure out what they have been doing, what they plan on doing, and what their pain points are. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, for example, um, I am, I'm cultivating a relationship with uh, our College of Business, and um, I think that the way it started was I, uh, I reached out to, I guess, the Director of External Relations for Business, 
and uh, I had a hefty number of stats that showed why a lot of the human skills that we teach and master in communication are necessary for not only our students who are going into the workforce, but also for uh, professionals who are already in the workforce. Uh, so I, I, I beat them down with some data, and uh, I asked if we could um, have a quick uh, lunchtime chat further, and he accepted that. He was actually excited by that, and uh, that led to me with the executive uh, team that's over executive education here at Marquette. And um, I need to actually answer an email from them. This reminds me. Um, but, you know, that relationship has been very fruitful because they actually reached out to me to help them with curriculum for uh, something they're putting together for a local person. So, um, you know, understand the fact that the skills and the knowledge that we have, uh, people people want it. It's not it, it, there's there's a lot of hunger in industry for human skills, essential skills. Some people call them soft skills. I call them power skills. Mm -hmm. And being able to, uh, you know, make people curious and then you can, you know, get into a meeting and really demonstrate your worth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's easy for us to underestimate some of the skills that we have. And that's one of the activities that I'm working through with some doctoral students here right now is just what are the transferable skills? And I made a comment in the chat earlier, the ability that doctoral students have for explaining phenomena and synthesizing it is, is just outstanding, but we're in this uh, you don't see the water when you're, when you're, you know, swimming in the water and that's the water we swim in. We just think it's normal that everybody can do those things. And so figuring out a way to translate those and communicate them, it seems like in a way that other people can understand them is so important. We have a, a question here from Carrie Lopez. Carrie, are you willing to, I think you do have the ability um, in your role to take yourself off mute. Would you be willing to share that? Absolutely. Um, I was just thinking that in um, this, this role of navigating being a pracademic and as you were you know, starting out and um, have had the wherewithal to go ask all these questions and meet all these people. You know, is there a tip that you wish or some sorts of tips that you wish someone would have shared with you as you were start starting out on your journey that you are now willing to share with us? Um, <laughs> um, so when you say starting out on the journey, do you mean when I was a grad school or when I first started my tenure track? What, and what part of the journey are we starting? Probably kind of this, this maybe branching out kind of that, that wherewithal, what prompted you initially to reach out to those career services centers and the, um, the business side of the university to even begin looking that way? And, and what did you kind of have to navigate as you were doing that? Mm, okay. Um, I will tell you a story about um, something that happened to be my first year at Marquette. Uh, I got a call from Career Services, and they were asking for me on behalf of Enterprise Rent a Car. Enterprise Rent a Car, their original office, they wanted someone to come in and do some training on ready and business communication. Um, I find it interesting that they call Career Services. They didn't call the business school. They didn't even call because communication. They went to career services, and somehow career services found me. So um, I hate to disappoint, but I, that wasn't my idea. The fact that career services, they relay information to me that I was able to use, that is kind of what educated me to I can use them as a resource. Um, as far as 
relationship with the business school, um, my, um, my first two degrees were in business. I did my undergrad in marketing, my MBA in management. So I've always been home there. And having the opportunity to work for the business school when I was in grad school, that was a wonderful thing. I, uh, I think that that experience is really what helped me understand the fact that it's good to have a partnership with folks over there when trying to navigate in their world. Um, I think as far as tips that people, I wish people would have shared, um, um, I wish that someone would have told me when I was in, in grad school that uh, there was more than one thing I could do with my expertise. And, um, you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm not faulting the program because, you know, they do what they're built to do. And they're built to manufacture tenure track professors. But if someone was actually in the college that said, you know, here are some other things that you can do if you decide this is not for you, um, that that would have been um, outstanding. Fantastic. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Dr. Waters, for that response. I did want to turn to Ben, who introduced you, and Ben also had a question, and Ben is going to come off mic and ask. Yes, um, thank you. Um, my question was, since you've worked with entrepreneurs so much, is there any like, I guess, general ad advice that you would give someone who's, you know, flirting with that idea to, to start their own business? Yeah. Um, if you are looking to launch a business, there are free resources that are available. Uh, they may be available through the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce is set up to aid small business owners in uh, building and scaling businesses. So uh, a lot of the resources that they provide, they may do, they may do that you know, for free or you know, at a very reasonable rate. Um, I would also um, study the market and figure out what makes you special. Try to figure out what sets you apart. If you go to the supermarket and you go to the bread aisle, what makes you buy one loaf of bread over another? <laughs> Think about your secret sauce that makes your loaf of bread the most flavorful, the most delicious, the most savory loaf out there. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, Dr. Waters. Sometimes I call that as someone's core genius, where it's, there, there is something within all of us where we are more expert at that, that particular area because of our background, whether or not we love all of the things about our background, our expertise, our interests and everything. And that, you know, when we can become self-aware about that, it does help us figure out those next steps. We do have a question here. Oh, did you have a response to that? Or did well, I was going to also add, find a mentor. Mm. Find more than one, actually. For sure. For sure. And this is one of Outside the things that's difficult, right? In if there is this circle of shame around pursuing non-academic work, it stunts that ability to find mentors. And this is something that Marco and I have been really passionate about in putting together this series and kind of taking it from this sort of like, oh, you're not supposed to talk about that. Ooh, did you tell your advisor that you were thinking about this? And really bringing it to bear, you know, so that we can better identify people like Dr. Waters and Dr. Kaisinger and start to build our networks on LinkedIn where we can see people who are doing this kind of work. So thank you so much. Okay, this is a question from Sarah. 
Sarah Strasser, and she says, uh, when it comes to the connections outside of the university, like the Chamber of Commerce, the startup community, et cetera, how do you approach them? Is it different than how you approach departments within the university? So um, startup community, Chambers of Commerce, um, they will typically have uh, weekly or monthly networking events. Um, just go and work the room. Um, we're communication people. We should be able to talk to people. Ask what they're doing. Ask people uh, what's, what's great about their businesses. Ask people what their challenges are. Ask people what keeping them up in, at night. Yeah, just uh, ask people, you know, where they want to be in uh, five to ten years. Like, you know, like if you ask somebody where they scratch, where they itch, they'll tell you. And then you can just swoop in and scratch that itch. <laughs> Fantastic. We have one last question for you. And this is from John Bannister. And they're asking, for those who don't have a background in business, are there any good ways to give yourself a crash course in business to better connect with corporate clients, show yourself to be credible for them? So if you don't, if you know, oh, wow. yeah, like how, if you're not a business person and you're not OrgCom, for instance, what, what's the best way to learn about some of these business issues that you've been discussing? There are, um, I, I believe Dr. Dr. Kaisinger name dropped HBR earlier. And, uh, you know, I, I like to flip through that uh, fairly reasonably, fairly, re fairly frequently. Uh, HBR has a, uh, a podcast as well that is usually a good listen to kind of get yourself immersed. Um, I would also go to the websites of consulting firms such as Deloitte, BCG, McKinsey and Company, Ernst & Young. They publish insights on their websites. Um, insights are similar to what we publish in journals, except they're a lot more fun to read and they make more sense, in my opinion. Uh, they are, um, they're, they're designed for more practical application. And, uh, you know, taking a look at, at those, what, what they have to say on diversity, equity, and inclusion, what they have to say on um, uh, recruitment and HR issues, uh, those, are, um, those, those are definitely good reads. I would also throw in this website called Investopedia. And um, that is something that I have steered my students to on occasion. Uh, I teach a course in financial communication and investor relations, which is very business jargon heavy. And uh, when students talk about, you know, not knowing what ROI is and not knowing what all these different ratios are and, you know, what's the difference between a, a balance sheet and a P&L statement, you know, I can direct them over to Investopedia. And it's very comprehensive. It gives you all those definitions and sometimes even some videos. Fantastic. Thank you for those resources. Well, Dr. Waters, thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom. Similar to uh, Dr. Kaisinger, I'm going to put into the chat box here a question if you would answer, audience. Um, what is one thing that you took away from Dr. Eric Waters' workshop? And feel free to post that or any other reactions. But we so appreciate your wisdom and time and thoughtfulness and, and everything. So thank you so much. I'm going to take a Thanks breath. Thanks for the invite. Have fun. I'm going to take a breath and I'm going to turn it over, Marco, to you. If you could go ahead and highlight your own video. And I, many of you have heard from Marco and he has been the, the 
the person who has helped make this happen. He and I uh, worked together to put together this grant in the fall, um, but all the logistics and everything. So if you feel like this has been planned well, send Marco a, a thumbs up and an acknowledgement. And he's going to say a little bit about what's coming up and just wrap us up together here. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Tracy. And thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. Waters and Dr. Kaisinger today. I have learned so much. I am myself a graduate student, so this is um, really insightful and amazing for me here as well, um, just to listen to all the wisdom coming from the both of you. Um, I'm, I'm excited by our audience participation. There seems to be a desire to learn more about this. There seems to be a, a gap in the training that we as graduate students receive in the academy. So I've been really enjoying this, and I'm sure that our audience is also enjoying this year a lot. I'm dropping the link for our other two events that are coming up in the chat box here so that people have a chance to take a look at that as well. Um, we have another event coming up this Friday um, at 1.45 p.m. Arizona time, which is the same as Pacific time for those of you who um, cannot handle the weird Arizona time zone. And we also have another event coming up one week from today at the exact same time, which is, which is 3 p.m. Um, open invitation for everyone. You're welcome to share that link uh, on your social media with your departments, with your business partners, and with everyone who might be interested. Um, you can also send your mentors over here or your advisors if you feel that they need to learn a little bit more about how to actually steer graduate students towards um, alt-ac and adjacent academic careers. Um, so we're always looking forward to hearing those voices here. Uh, once again, thank you very much, um, especially our speakers, Dr. Kaisinger and Dr. Waters here. Thank you, Dr. Tracy and um, everyone else. I hope to see you on Friday. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about the upcoming event or about today's event. We will be posting those recordings at some point on the NCA website. And um, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night and bye-bye. Uh, thank you all.